Hello, we're here today in uh, close vicinity to our Bering Marine Shipyard in Antalya and it's one of our technical sea trials and today we've been visited by Scott, uh, I forgot your last name, Judson. Uh, by, uh, today we've been visited by Scott Judson, uh, he came from Vancouver, Canada to our sunny Antalya and uh, he is naval architect of this boat and a couple other models which we uh, have in production. So we have a close cooperation for some time now and so today we see trialing this magnificent boat. Scott, the 34 foot aluminum, is it unique or it's popular? Like uh, you have a lot of experience in creating foiling boats, what is most popular? I would say size and where the foil work best. Well, this is a, a very popular size for owner-operated um, boats for, for uh, recreational fishing um, and family use, but also uh, we found it a very popular size in commercial operations as well. These, this size of boat is used for pilot boats, um, police operations, fisheries, that sort of thing. So it's a very practical um, size that works in many functions, a very rugged boat as well, so it's capable of operating in, in extreme conditions. Um, and, and because of the enclosed house as well, you know, it can operate in, in cold or hot climates, depending on, on where the owner wants to operate the boat. Is it like most popular size in foiling crafts or bigger, smaller, like what, based on your experience? I think it's the most popular size um, for um, open water, you know, open water use. It, 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 it has the ability to carry um, a, a lot of weight uh, without in, in negatively affecting the performance. And of course, the, the true advantage of the foil assist catamaran is, is its ability to operate um, comfortably, uh, fantastic sea keeping in open ocean use. So for people that value ride comfort, for people that need to operate in open water, um, this is a fantastic platform. To me, comfort comes first in mind when we're speaking of foiling crafts. So in my opinion, like a base of 28, because I have great experience of using our 28 reap, uh, it's 20 times more comfortable in real sea condition than monohull. Um, this craft, uh, I mean, it's second sea trial. We it feels like Rolls Royce on the on the water. In the in the two three foot chops, chop you don't feel anything. But uh, fuel consumption wise, because it's it's another advantage of foiling crafts. Comfort, in my opinion, number one. I don't know if you agree with me or not. But fuel saving wise, what what how you can compare monohulls, catamarans, and foiling cats? Okay, through, through all the testing that's been done historically, um, as well as our own experience, that you, know, you would expect a you know, 25 to 30 percent fuel saving in, in the ideal operational range. So you know, when you're, these boats um, are designed to run you know, between 30 and 40 knots, and, and, and they have a fairly um, flat range curve in that speed range. So, um, that's where the real advantage is because the foil is so much more efficient at generating the lift, uh, so much more efficient than, than the actual hull form of any type of boat. Um, that's where the economy comes in. It's just reducing resistance and improving, um, in, in improving the fuel burn as a result. Yeah. But uh, what's interesting to me that, um, you know, like foiling cat, I, I don't consider it's a really cat because it's behaved more like a monohull, you know, it's turning into the, it's banking into the turn, and it's very agile. I mean, it's it's not like on on the cat, like classic cat. You feel like you're a little bit tippy when you come to the sharp turn. On the, on the foiling crafts, it's different. And um, you know, as little as I know about naval architecture, foiling crafts, it's basically a monohull where we carve the tunnel and position the foil, stationary foil in between. And in my opinion, it's like it's something different. It's not cat, it's not monohull, it's, it's something else. What's your opinion about this? Well, the, um, the, this style of hull, the asymmetric catamaran hull, is one that um, 
probably achieved its its optimal um, e existence in the in the in the offshore racing world, um, where the rules do not um, the rules are they don't care what type of hull you have. Um, it's an open class, but as but through the process of optimization um, and trying to achieve the best result, they have they settled on this style of hull. And now that's all you see for many, many years. All they've raced is, is foil assist cats, or not foil assist, but asymmetric catamarans. So, um, and these are, you know, 100, 120 mile an hour yeah. boats, you know. So, so in a way, that's an independent verification of the efficiency of the hull form. The, adding the foil basically does, does two things. It allows the sponsons to be narrower because they're not carrying the weight of the boat. So that in itself improves sea keeping. There's less hull surface to resist the wave static, so the boats cut through better. Um, and then the foil, of course, supplementing that to generate the lift that is lost by the narrower hulls. And those two things combined produce the extraordinary sea keeping. But also, let's remember, it is a catamaran in the sense that it has the, the wide separation of the hulls, which produces um, natural stability at anchor, like we are now at rest, um, which is very important to, um, you know, we have people who have been attracted to these boats for this, you know, the fact that they can be at anchor and with their family and have food and fish and be comfortable and not you know, constantly moving and moving and moving. So in respect to zero speed stabilization, it's behaved more like a monohull. Basically, the sea keeper, like any gyro uh, stabilizer, would stabilize this boat. Um, I think it has the same. It has the same inherent stability as, as any catamaran. I don't. Um, it, it would be hard to fit a stabilizer. I don't. I, t I typically would say, you know, that a stabilizer wouldn't matter. You know, but um, says that it's it's more behaved like a monohull. And we never put Seakeeper. We frequently ask about stabilization. This boat is actually a first boat we put interceptors, and we're uh, quite excited about this because I think it's a we replace basically the aft foils, which we usually put on on our models. We replace it with interceptors, and I run it first times with working interceptors. It's it's cool. On the way, it's perfect stabilization. I mean, it's control roll and pitch. At zero speed, um, I think Seakeeper will work just fine on this boat. Well, it would be worth an experiment. We've never um, found the need for it. I think the only problem is you want the Seakeeper in the middle of the boat, so there's not much middle. No, it's, it's, not, it's not a requirement. Seakeeper yeah. shouldn't be in the middle of yeah. the boat. Yeah. When is the foils become effective? Like how small foiling crafts could be like to make sense? Well, I think the... Um, the, you know, we've we've done them down to five meters, and they're very effective. Um, so I think no, fuel efficiency is going. I mean, it's diminishing because the fuel consumption on the smaller crafts is minuscule anyway. Yes, correct. And our 30-40 saving is not come to play as a major factor, but is it still a comfort there? Because our smallest craft so far is 8.5 meters. We have no experience, and we have we developed with you a uh, seven-meter craft. And where is the breaking point? Where is no no reason to make a, a hydrofoil well, like support? Said, we've, we've we've gone down to five meters, and and, it, and it's very effective. So um, we haven't tried to do more like a smaller recreational craft. Um, in the recreational craft world, they're looking at you know because they're relatively lighter boats, they're looking at you know full hydrofoiling boats. But it's it's a, it's, a, uh, it's an it's not a new solution as you know, but it's it's a, it's a complex solution that has a lots of downsides as well. Even it's brilliant when it works. So, but I would say there's you know down to five meters. I haven't really had you know thought about or even with catamarans, you typically don't see them much smaller than that. So. Yeah. Because you know, a smaller boat too. You're, you know, proportionally, you're more. The sea is bigger, <laughs> anyway. So your problems are different. What was your largest? The largest um, foiling craft is approximately 20 meters at the stage. Commercial vessels that we've done. We've done Ferry more or? commercial. Well, more uh, passenger. Um, your know, tour boats. Um, these are boats that are certified uh, by U.S. Coast Guard for Subchapter T applications. Uh, um, for how many passengers? I think yeah, we've done up to 48 passengers.
so. Um, and, and of course, that is an area where um, the virtues of this style of craft uh, operating commercially, where you're getting, uh, you're running tours with non-marine, boat, non-boating people, they don't know what to expect. Uh, their comfort is, of course, paramount. You know, you don't want people getting seasick and, you know, I mean, and, and you want to give them the best opportunity to enjoy their day as possible. And that's, that's why this type of, as commercial operators who have no, they, all they care about is results. You know? That's so, true. So they, they find this, um, they're not in, in, they don't care about fashion or what you know, their neighbors think about them. They just want the best outcome for their business. And running the fuel economy and ride quality and stability that's, are super important to them yeah. because of running passengers and also the day-to-day -day cost of fuel is very significant over the course of a 12-month period. Yeah, it's uh, because we sell probably like half of our sales is commercial and the, their value is fuel efficiency and not that much comfort. It's, it's more like in the, for them who spent hours and hours at sea yeah. moving, it's not that much comfort, it's, it's their health. They're saving their back, they yeah. having their neck. Well, one thing we found, no with, it's, one it's thing we found with sea keeping, uh, in terms of uh, discussing it with people, is that people will typically run a boat. Uh, if you have three boats lined up, they will go out on any given day and run those boats to the same level of comfort. You know, what feels right to them, that's tolerable to them. But the difference between, say, this boat and an equivalent size monohull with the same power, the difference will be in that situation will be the speed of the boat. Right. So the operator is not going, oh, this is comfortable. He'll be going, the difference is he'll be going 35 knots and the monohull might be going 26 knots That's and correct. they're feeling the same level of comfort. So, so they're you know, not thinking, oh, this is comfortable. They're thinking, no, now I'm comfortable. Now I'm not comfortable. That's the speed I'm going. You know how, was, how I was falling in love and eventually bought the company? It's, um, we went on a sea trial in Cape Town, rough, rough sea, and the guy closed the gauge and we were going and, you know, I have some experience at sea and he asked me what the speed we're going. I said 26, 27 knots. He opened the gauge, was 42. I mean, it's, it's completely, it's completely turned my mind upside down. I could not expect such a mistake. I could have said maybe five knots, but, you know, that mistake and it's how good it is in the rough sea. It struck me from the first minute and not a single drop of water. So all sprays behind because we're running high. Yeah, I, um, I work with a number of firms in the US that have been building um, uh, catamarans, similar platform, welded aluminum. Um, and, and I say to them sincerely, I do not know why you would build a catamaran that isn't foil assist. They should be synonymous. It should just be a given. Um, there's no reason not to. It's not a complicated device. It's not a fragile device. Um, it's not an expensive device, yes. uh, but it, it gives you so much. And it's so simple. There is no moving parts. Yes. It's, it's rigid, it's rugged. You know, we slice in coconuts and in Miami, like they're, they're like nothing. You don't even feel before I was trying to navigate between them and then hell with it. Yes, we tell so our clients that in the Pacific Northwest where we have lots of uh, debris in the water, large logs, timber, that sort of thing, that the foil is actually the strongest part of the boat. That's true. And because and, and, everyone thinks, oh, what if I hit something with the foil? The foil is the strongest single part of the boat. It would be the best place to hit something as opposed to the aluminum hulls, you know, which you could dent or, you know, get scraped or whatever. So That's true. Would you agree with me? I have a prediction that in 10 years, 60% of crafts under 40 feet will be hydrofoil supported cats. This is my prediction. I firmly believe in it. What do you opinion about Well, the this? only thing, the only thing that I would, or the only reason I would dispute those numbers possibly is, is you know, what I call the boat show concept. And, and that is why, you know, why do people continue to make you know, these, these monohulls that have been, you know, the hull form te technically is from the 50s, you know, it's, it's, and one of the reasons I believe, and I think it's, you know, is the accommodation space, the ease of accommodation. And that is a challenge, particularly in a smaller boat like this, to simulate that level of accommodation. So all the things we've discussed, sea keeping, stability, fuel economy, 
accommodations over here. So accommodation is... I is, give it 40%. <laughs> yeah, so well, accommodation though is is for many you know people who buy boats at boat shows, you know they that's that's what they're seeing. They open the door and they go, oh, there's our cabin. Oh, there's the other cabin. And you know the cabin might be tiny and unlivable, but it's there. And it, you know, so that, that would be my only. No, I think a lot point. of open boats or like fishing platforms or commercial platforms when you basically need a deck space. Uh, we have a version. I mean, you know that you develop it with a with a pilot house which is ideal for, for uh, um, rescue boats, for pilots, for police, for any kind of government service. So, and accommodation is a secondary. Yes. And also on the open smaller boats, let's say from five meters to uh, 10 meters, they, in, in US especially, they all center consoles. Yes. So you don't, no. you don't really yeah. need this space for accommodations, but for everything else you have plenty. You have fish yeah. boxes here, you have fuel tanks, you have everything. Yeah, and some of, that's, some of that revolves around um, more experienced owners, more experienced owners who actually understand how they really use a boat. Whereas at a boat show, you're looking around, you think you need four cabins and three heads in a 40-foot boat, true. Um, but you don't. And, and you never use them, and they end up just being stored, people just store junk in them. That's um, but that's in, you know, but once you have the experience of, of using a boat, then your, your understanding of what it needs changes. That's right. So, um, we developed the electric um, nine meter transporter. What, in general, what do you think about uh, electric propulsion application for, for hydrofoil supported cats? Well, um, remembering that the, the client for that, for, who, who came to Bering originally with that idea, um, also knew they wanted a foil assist cat. So they, as an experienced um, tour operator, they understood the um, why the foil assist cat. And one of the main reasons for them is, well, three, they needed a rugged boat. Um, not a toy. They needed um, a boat that could um, operate at planing speeds, so not not a five, six, eight. Yeah. No, but it had to, they knew how they had to get through the day, get a certain number of runs. So they had a speed, and and they operate in, in difficult conditions. So all those things uh, pointed that client exactly to this direction, and and I think their their list of criteria that led to to this nine meter, 12 passenger, four assist boat is exactly the same criteria that would apply to any commercial operator operating that type of craft, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. Certainly where I'm from in the Pacific Northwest, exactly the same, exactly the same. Do you think it's a future for electric? I, I think that electric, yeah, I think electric propulsion, um, you know, the, the propulsion part, the engine part is nothing new. That's the engines, electric motors, that's easy. Forever. Yeah, so the only thing that, the, the only restriction at this stage, as we all know, is battery um, capacity for weight. And, and right now the, um, um, the battery capacity weight doesn't really allow the versatility uh, that, that you would want in a private boat you know, to operate. Um, but a commercial operator who tends to run a fixed run with a fixed understanding of distance and time and recharge facilities ashore, um, absolutely you know we're, we're there now that can definitely be done on a case-by-case -case basis um, and what these operators also understand is that battery technology will improve yes. and over time the the basic boat the drivetrain the motors all that can stay in the boat and all that you'll do is replace the batteries and the batteries will get smaller uh, either or smaller or, or, or more capacity higher higher energy density so both win-win there they understand that's going to happen, and so they're they're comfortable to move forward. Yeah, I think, but even now, even today's technology allow us to go like 35 to 40 miles exactly. with a reasonable payload of 10, 12, 14 people. And for tender application, it's even better. It's usually less load, and even today we can we can offer tender application. Absolutely. With electric propulsion. Absolutely. I mean, most super yachts have a uh, limousine tenders that are designed basically just to take passengers back and forth to the shore, and and that is the electric electrification is moving quickly on that level as well for that reason because you know, the specific application allows it. And also more and more aquatorious. I was penalized in the, in the near Capri 
I went by dinghy to some bay and then uh, local whoever, this guy's law enforcement came and I got a ticket for $300 because this particular bay is fossil fuel free. Yes. For whatever reason, it's fossil fuel free and it's more and more territories like this everywhere. It is and those areas are, you could almost say they're uncharted now for, for um, having boats on them because being uh, fossil fuel banned areas, there's no activity. So now the possibility for activity exists with the electrification of boats. That's, so that's so it's a whole, it's almost like a new world that's going to open up places people haven't been able to enjoy will become available to them now. So. You know, what fascinates, we kind of swing a little bit back, the racing world, the, I mean, sailboat, you know, all this Volvo racing, uh, US Cup and everything, all crafts are foiling crafts. And there is no chance for non falling craft to compete. They have all the same amount of sails in the class. They have all the same wind to propel them. So foiling crafts go faster, no questions. So race, racing is proving it. Uh, that's the reason why I think that 60% of crafts, for those who don't value accommodation over comfort and practicality. Um, that's why my prediction of 60% has come back to play. I, I firmly believe it's, it's just nonsense to not to use foil when it's such an obvious uh, advantages and when the whole racing world is foiling now. Yes. Well, the, um, the, the foils have become ubiquitous on so many levels, you know, surfboards, and sailboards. Yes, and, everything. And even up to that, like you said, the America's Cup level. So people are very foil conscious now, whereas 10 years ago, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. Now everyone goes, hey, yeah, foil, of course, you know, they, they get it. So that's, that's an important thing. So, um, and I think also, um, you know, there's a lot of, specific use areas in the marine world like you take the sport fishing you know south florida the sport fishing industry you know they they create these boats that'll do you know have six you know motors on the back and they can go 80 90 100 miles an hour and but they can't do that in the sport fishing when they're actually fishing because you know the the, the distance they have to travel the, the duration they have to have means they run it 35 knots or maybe, you know, like everyone else, because they run out of fuel, right? right. Exactly. So just in that application alone, you know, where, where they, catamarans have made big inroads, but you add a foil to that and suddenly you improve their, their range capability by 25, 30%. That's significant. It, it impacts on their competitiveness, their ability to run faster and get to the tournament ground faster, stay longer, you know, all those things. So you can look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and you really agree no, with you, you say, why not? It's advantageous because we have this uh, center console, 30-foot uh, model, yeah. and um, we can put 400, 500 miles on single yes. fuel tank on it with a good payload. And the, the, for me, it's fascinating that when you're foiling, your hydrodynamics change compared to um, uh, uh, planing yes. and uh, then at least like what I experienced on 28 and 30 you have a plateau when you get on foil let's say at 18 knots or vicinity of 18 knots depends on the load and then up to 43 knots on model 20 you have a flat consumption yes. a mile per liter <laughs> like flat and then it start to rise yeah. and it's also rising when you go slower, when you're not foiling. However, I, I notice very interesting effect. In a vicinity of 32 knots, we're not only foiling, we start uh, run on air cushion. The pressure build up in a tunnel and we catch this effect on fairly flat tunnel of the 28. So, and you can recognize it by, you know, shaking a wheel a little bit and you like on ice, you, you're sort of floating yeah. on surface. Of course, it's on, a, on a, a flat water, this effect. However, I feel like it's at, it's like when you get from foil to the air, it's really give you a, an edge. Scott, does it make sense to build a 50 foot uh, vessel um, with foils or it's 
you know, this size is already better to have classic cat. What's your opinion? No, absolutely. Um, we, we are doing projects in that size range at the moment. Um, they're more what you call uh, chase boats or, you know, they're not, they're not fully founded cruising yachts. They're still in the, in the sort of commercial performance side of things, you know, but they're, um, we're doing boats with both uh, inboard you know, IPS drives as well as, as multiple outboards. So IPS drives work on Absolutely. On Absolutely. Oh, great. Yeah. And they give you the advantage uh, in a diesel application, they give you the advantage of the electronic steering and the joystick control and position holding and all those sort of things. So very easy installation, obviously, too, relative to, you know, traditional inboard. Um, but you can run traditional inboards um, and surface drives. That kind of thing works really well. The only limit I would say uh, is that you really um, don't want to develop a boat to go much faster than 50 knots if you want to have a, a conventional foil right. boat. If you, if you need to go faster, then it requires some, uh, uh, an adjustable foil, which is going to get a little more sophisticated in terms of design. I'm, and, and I'm for keeping it simple, stupid. 50 knots is pretty fast. 50 <laughs> knots is fast. Over 50, you go into insurance issues and safety issues in my opinion. Absolutely, yeah. my, my border is 55 knots. Yeah. When I get to 55, I'll pull back. Yeah. So, but hydrofoil supported crafts can go really fast. Yes, but not necessary. Like, you know, I mean, it's, you know, cruising at 40. You have a 50 knot boat, you can cruise at 40. That's about as far That's as you want to go. And again, the consumption is flat. Yes. You can choose your cruise speed, depends on the sea condition, and you're not going to lose the efficiency. Absolutely. The only so the so the, 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 the general guideline for a foil assist boat um, is has been traditionally that you want um, 60 horsepower per ton of boat. Mm -hmm. uh, in monohull, how much is required? Uh, I don't have a figure for that. <laughs> I think monohull. it's closer to 100. Yeah, uh, in, um, if I remember correctly. Right, but we find that you know to it's better to be around 70 horsepower per ton. You know, so that that's a limit case. If you if you wanted to design a larger you know, 80-foot vessel. Um, you would look at you look at the the weight of the vessel and think about the power requirements. It's not that different from. I mean, it's better than a normal planing boat, but you're you're still talking a planing boat. So, yeah. if you want to do an 80-foot planing hull, that's a that's got big engines. You know, and that's, it's a that's true. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It was interesting chat, and I hope we'll, you will come to Antalya more frequently, and we will develop new boats, build them, see trial them. Well, and sell them eventually. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been wonderful. Um, really enjoyed it. Beautiful part of the world. Highly recommend it to everyone. Great.